Nope, you're muted. You're <laughs> muted. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. We're waiting for just a few more participants to join. Please stand by. Doing construction. Welcome everybody. I'm Leslie Bellissimo, director of the Long Island Hamptons Hardball. This event is a webinar, which means as participants, you will not be seen or heard. The only people you will be seeing today are the people presenting. If you have any questions or for our chef or for our doctor, you can leave questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Lastly, I just want to mention that this call is being recorded. One of our very generous sponsors, Ingrid Arnberg, is sponsoring today's pre-event Hamptons Heartball kickoff. And she's joining us right now to share a few words. Hi, everyone. My name is Ingrid Arneberg, and I am the community honoree for this year's 2020 Hampton Heart Ball. Thank you all for joining us as we welcome my friend, vegan chef, Matt Korski. He runs the Green Street food truck. He's going to prepare a heart healthy lunch for us. I know I'm ready in my kitchen. So ladies and gentlemen, I present chef, Matt Korski. You're unmuted. You're good. All right. Thank you. It's nice to see everyone today. Hope everyone's having a great and safe day. Um, I'd like to thank Ingrid and uh, the American Heart Association for inviting me to do this uh, cooking demo. I'd also like to thank uh, my good friend. Michael Straw from Sweet Soul Bakery for opening his uh, beautiful space for me to uh, host it. And if you're ever in the area of Long Island, specifically St. James, and looking for some really amazing baked treats and desserts, which just happen to be vegan gluten free, this is definitely the space for me. So today we're going to do a vegan tuna salad. Uh, and tuna salad was something that I always grew up really enjoying, uh, but I think it's also something that people either love or hate. It's either like, either really love it or you just can't stand it. But for me, it's something that I grew up loving, my mom always made. And then when I went vegan about eight years ago, it was something that I knew I needed to kind of get into and change. I just wasn't having the too many more. And for us, we do a couple different recipes with it. Uh, on the truck, we do chickpeas, but at home, we've also experimented using canned jackfruit as well as uh, banana blossoms. So both of those give it slightly different taste and texture, but they also work pretty well. Um, I've also used them for like chicken salad as well. So feel free to experiment. Um, and the vegan tuna salad is really great. You can use it in a sandwich, which we're going to be demonstrating today. But you can also put it on a salad, which is something that we do on the food truck as well. So we're going to start with a can of chickpeas. This is just an organic can of chickpeas, also known as garbanzo beans from Trader Joe's. So you're just going to want to uh, drain the can, rinse it, and then you're going to put it right into your rinsing bowl. And chickpeas are really great uh, for this and a lot of other recipes, simply because they're really high in fiber and a really great protein source. Especially for some of you new to choosing a more plant-based or vegan diet and lifestyle, protein is probably something that's on your mind. Great source of your chickpeas, black beans, and quinoa is one of the best because it has all nine essential amino acids. So from there, we're just going to take a fork, or you if you have a potato masher, you're just going to mash the chickpeas until they 
kind of get smushed together. You want to leave some whole that you get some of that taste and texture from the whole chickpeas. And if you don't want to buy the canned chickpeas, you could also soak them, like the dried chickpeas, cook them in the pressure cooker or on the stove overnight. Uh, you want to soak them, and then the next thing you're going to cook on the stove or in that pressure cooker. It takes a little bit longer, but then you can also control the amount of sodium uh, that's in it. So if that's something that you're concerned about, that's an easier uh, way to control that and be a little bit more mindful of what's in those chickpeas. All right, so you might be noticing as you're smashing the chickpeas that the skin of the chickpeas is coming off. It's perfectly fine. You don't have to worry about removing that, peeling it off. You're not even going to notice once it's all mashed in. And again, another way that you might want to do it, might save a little bit of time and might be a little bit easier on it, is using a fruit processor, uh, which is, again, a nice tool that we use in the kitchen at home and on the truck all the time. You can actually throw all the chickpeas in, throw in um, the diced onions and celery, as well as all the other spices and the mayo, put it in the food processor, hit pulse about a dozen times, and you'll have the tuna salad. So right now, the chickpeas, mostly masked up, we're gonna do just a little bit more. And another way that I really like to use chickpeas at home is when we make like Buddha bowls at home, which is a huge hit for my wife and my kids. We usually do like a garlicky roasted chickpeas. So you can, same thing, just drain the chickpeas, rinse them, and we add a little bit of garlic, a little bit of salt and pepper, put them on a baking sheet, and then you can bake them in the oven at 350 for about 15 to 20 minutes until they start to get like a dark golden brown and crispy, and you'll be good to go. But chickpeas are ready. So next we're gonna go with the onion. Hopefully you guys all brought your protective eyewear. I forgot mine at home, but I won't see any of you crying because of the onion. You might be seeing me. So we're gonna do a quarter of onion. This is actually kind of a big onion, so I'm gonna do a little bit less than that. I'm gonna peel off the outer skin. I'm gonna slice this onion three more times. Lengthwise, and then from there, turn on the side, and then you can just do little dices right there, so it's nice and easy to dice. And prepping on the food truck takes a lot of time, and this is the one thing that no one wants to do because all the tears that come from the onion. But has a lot of nice crunch and flavor with this chickpeas to the So chickpeas, onions are in. Next we're going to dice up the celery. So again, cutting it lengthwise, long strips. We have two stalks of the celery. Slide them together, and just like we did with the onions. Just cut them in small little chunks. Of course, if you want a little bit finer, you can. I prefer my chickpea to be a little bit right. Slide that in. All right, so right now we have the onions, the celery, and the chickpeas all together. So next we're going to add our spices. So we have dried dill. If you have fresh, that works great. It's been a little bit tricky here on Long Island to find a lot of fresh ingredients, but we have our sea salt, black pepper. I'm just going to mix that up just a little bit before we add in our vegan mayonnaise. So today I'm using uh, vegan mayo from Hellman's, a great brand that I would prefer to use is actually just mayo, but they've been really focusing on expanding, so it's been really difficult to find that brand. But you could find this uh, in Target, Stop and Shop, most local grocery stores, depending on where you live, you can be able to find it. So I'm going to do two healthy scoops of, uh, two hearty scoops of the vegan mayo. And then we're just going to mix that together. 
Again, some people like their tuna salad to be a little bit wetter with more mayo. If you prefer that, you can do so. Uh, but I like mine a little bit less on the gooey with the mayo. So you can really taste more of the chickpeas and the spices. So, all mixed in. Next, we're going to get our bread and our avocado. So, this is a bread that I like to use on Fergie. It's a gluten free and vegan bread that you can find in most local grocery stores. They got a couple of different types. So, this is like their classic white. They also do a Texas toast. All right, we have our bread. We're just going to scoop a little bit onto each. All right, and an avocado. So this is going to be the pivotal moment. Is it right? It's one of those things that you know it. Today is right. Tomorrow is no good. Let's see what happens. Open. Fingers crossed it's a perfect avocado. It is ready to go. You can also do a tuna melt, uh, a couple of brands of the vegan cheese that I really like. Follow Your Heart is a really good brand. Uh, you can also get uh, some other slices from like Miyoko's, which is a really good brand. But again, they're becoming more popular. You can find a Whole Foods, Fairway Market, ShopRite. Uh, even smaller grocery stores you can have. And then here we go, we have our tuna salad sandwich. Created a nice little mess from Michael and Sweet Soul. But here we go, nice and simple. The one thing that I kind of learned quickly as I became more adept with, with cooking vegan is being okay to experiment and try new things. Even if this recipe you know, has certain ingredients in it, Feel free to try new things, like adding in the, the jacket to it. Uh, maybe trying some butter beans, maybe even doing some banana blossoms, or sometimes when we make like a mock chicken salad, we'll throw in some cranberries or some fresh diced apples or something like that. So you don't have to kind of be stuck with one thing. Feel free to expand and try uh, items into it. But again, I want to say thank you to everyone for joining me today. Uh, and again, if you're ever in St. James, Check out Sweet Soul Bakery or check out Green Tree Food Truck. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. That was fantastic and delicious. I can't wait to eat my sandwich when we're done. Now I'd like to introduce to you uh, our Long Island Board of Directors, Vice President and ex Cardiologist Extraordinaire, Dr. Rajiv Jihar. Hello, everyone. Uh, just, what a nice uh, lunch you had prepared. Uh, it sounds beautiful and very tasty. You know, if we eat like that all the time, I'll lose my job. I'll have nothing to do. Uh, I want to welcome you. I want to thank you for joining. You know, we're living in a very strange time. I'm sitting here in my office. I'm about to do a procedure in about 30 minutes. And uh, COVID-19 has really taken over. Our, our life, uh, you know, this, this virus the, has taken over our lives and has entered our space, um, especially the cardiac space. And so my job is to sort of go over what we have experienced. Um, can you, I assume you can see my slides, but this is our pandemic, our lessons learned from, our, from Northwell Health. As you know, we're one of the largest health systems in the country. We have now seen over 14,000 cases and and Long Island and Manhattan are really the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic, not just in the U.S., but really in the world. Uh, the amount of cases we've seen, you know, our, one of our hospitals, Long Island Jewish, has normally has 585 beds. We were at peak capacity over 920 patients in that in the bed in the hospital. So you can imagine <clears throat> uh, where we were uh, squeezing patients in left and right. Uh, we have learned a lot from pandemics over the last uh, several centuries. You know, it, it's interesting, you know, the pandemics occur around the 20th. 
So I will not be around for the next one, but 1720, 1820, we all know about the Spanish pandemic in 1918 to 20, and then the world pandemic this year, which has really changed our lifestyles. You know, in, on January the 3rd, I was in Hong Kong on vacation and uh, all hell broke loose the week later. So thank God I got back uh, very early in, in the game. Uh, I'm just gonna show you one case because Abnormal is now the new normal. This is a gentleman, and, and I'm not asking you to read an EKG, but he presented with a classic finding uh, of an acute myocardial infarction. Stuff that when I, when I give talks at the, for the American Heart or at the American Heart, I say this is someone who needs, needs to go straight for a cardiac cath and, 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 and open up his, his or her arteries. Well, he had normal arteries. He had completely normal arteries which was shocking to us because his EKG clearly showed a, a, an infarct. And we're seeing a lot of this nowadays, you know, his heart function was initially normal, but he had a large a fluid right here in, around his heart that we drained and took out this sort of uh, straw-like fluid from his pericardium um, that he did uh, that he did better initially and then, then unfortunately expired. He was 51 years old. We're seeing a lot of these patients nowadays. You know, with, with COVID-19, age is not discriminating. Uh, I've seen a 33-year-old have a stroke. I've seen a 26-year-old have uh, what we call myocarditis or inflammation of the heart. Uh, we've seen people die old and young. So it, it, is, it is definitely not discriminating. Uh, but one thing that we found very interesting is that, and we saw this also from the Chinese data and from the Italian and Spanish data, is patients are scared of coming to the hospital. So the outreach that the American Heart is doing and other people are doing is of such paramount importance because patients are just so fearful of catching COVID and staying, are just staying home despite having aggressive symptoms. I mean, Anecdotally, I can tell you that my own friends who have called me, who I was convinced were having a heart attack, and they called me at 10 o'clock at night, and I told her to go to the emergency room, but she adamantly refused, and only wanted to see me in the office the next day. And I finally cast her, and she had a blockage, and I, I fixed it. But the reality is that outreach right now, and education, and, and, and community uh, statements are so important, because with all due respect, everyone is now the expert. If you go on the internet without any peer review, everyone has an idea for everything. Take vitamin D, take hydrochloroquine, take, you know, uh, take 3,000 units of, uh, you know, vi vitamin C. There's no data to support that. And so until we have some peer review data, no one really knows what to do. I don't know what to do. All I do know is that our heart attack patients are staying home and we need to get them back into the hospital. As the trend has gone down for COVID, you know, in our health system, we peaked at 3,400 COVID patients within all our 23 hospitals. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say today we have less than 1,000 in the hospitals. And uh, so we're returning to some semblance of normalcy, but normalcy requires, you know, uh, to have a new normal. But this is what we're seeing. The, the new normal is the unexpected. You know, this is a gross, gruesome picture of clot from, that we removed from someone's para, uh, lung space as he was having a large pulmonary embolism. That's a lot of clot. And we're seeing a lot of clot in these patients, which is, uh, which is very disconcerting. The one thing that we, we have realized is that what is happening to our patients? And so we got some data that we're publishing uh, from New York City FDNY, which shows that if you look at the blue blue graph, this is what we normally see in on a daily basis from the previous year, about 30 sudden deaths at home that the FDNY goes in and then they, they pronounce them dead. During the peak of our pandemic, which was around April the 7th, there were about 280 sudden deaths daily. Some probably due to COVID, but probably a majority of them due to sudden death from heart disease, that patients who refuse to come to the emergency room 
because they were having chest pain and were just so fearful. That is our new norm. And we're seeing, if you just look in our department, a, a 80 to 90% decrease in procedures over the last month as compared to the year before for the same time period. So clearly that fear factor is leading to people not coming to the hospital to a fewer number of procedures, but also an increased number of, 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 of events outside the hospital. This became our new norm. Our recovery space became a, uh, a COVID unit in the cath lab. Our auditorium, this is where the, uh, the speaker stands and speaks out here, which are where all our chairs in an auditorium were made into a COVID unit. Our short stay unit was closed out so the patients could sit out, to be out here and be monitored. We took one of our cath labs and made it into a took one of our cath labs and made it into a, um, a recovery space. We built a portable heart hospital outside in a parking lot. And, and, and that was the bad part about this thing. The good parts where we created amazing partnerships, you know, not just interdepartmental and not just within our health system, but with community programs. The American Heart has played such a vital role in, in getting the message out that even in the COVID era, you can still have heart disease. You could still have problems. Controlling your blood pressure is of paramount importance. Just because you are, are quarantined and, and stay at home does not mean you don't, you don't need to exercise or eat right. You know, the one thing I've done when I get home in the afternoon, I walk six to eight miles every day. And with all due respect, I never did that before. I would exercise only with tennis twice a week. But now I walk every day with my wife. Our relationship is as good as it's ever been because we walk our dog six to eight miles every day. Our dog is in the best shape possible. But that education is, is so, so important for everybody. Um, what have we learned? Well, this is really a Zoom call all along the Brady Bunch, but we presume now everyone is COVID positive because we know that 80% of patients who are asymptomatic can have COVID. This is where social distancing plays such a vital role. And, and, and I cannot uh, uh, stress enough that I know that on the 15th, we're gonna open up some essential things in New York and, and, and the area, but it's important to maintain the social distancing. So we need to stay ahead of the curve. We need to use masks and PPEs when necessary. We have learned a lot, but communication, communication, communication. It's important in relationships, it's important in healthcare, it's important in everything. And, you know, telehealth is now here to stay. Telemonitoring, you know, using smart watches, getting your EKG done at home, e-learning, e-health. Uh, today, today and yesterday, I did about 15 telehealth visits in people's homes using uh, e uh, Zoom and, and, and uh, different telehealth uh, platforms which have really, really helped. We have changed our whole paradigm in terms of approval for drugs, for ch sending patients home the same day. We have learned a lot from this, this, this process. But one thing we have learned is we have to overcome this fear. And to overcome the fear, we need to create COVID-free spaces. We need to make sure that the patients and the staff feel safe. We need to do appropriate pre-procedure testing. So we don't let patients in the hospital without COVID testing now prior to a procedure. Uh, and we've created testing sites all over the island to help us with that. We provide PPE to all our staff daily now. We change our N95 masks daily. These, these beautiful masks have saved many a life um, and are paramount, paramount importance. Because as we open up, we wanna mitigate the second wave, which is gonna happen. We saw that in the Spanish pandemic and we're gonna see it now again. So it's important for us, all of us to be smart, but yet get back to some semblance of normalcy. It is really important. And so we create our four Ps to elective procedure re-engagement, the preparation of the patient, what, how to screen the patient, how to deal with the procedure and how to deal with the post-care. Uh, 
the American Heart's response has been has been terrific. They have funded us. They've funded uh, response grants. They've launched uh, hospital-based uh, registries because we know that people who are obese or hypertensive who have cardiac risk factors are at increased risk for events with COVID-19. Your risk is higher if you're hypertensive than if you're not a hypertensive. And if you're poorly controlled hypertensive, it's even worse. So they've worked with local partners to supply healthy meals. They've been advocating uh, serving the underserved communities, uh, which we have seen a definite uh, increase in uh, significant COVID-19 event rates. So the reality is that, you know, times seem a bit grim, scary, uh, but there's always hope. Monday, that recovery space I showed you earlier, which, which was a COVID unit, has now been opened up again. It was cleaned out. We are now bringing patients back into the hospital uh, electively. Patients are less fearful of coming in if they have symptoms. So we have a lot more patients who are coming in. Uh, on Monday, I, we did se I did 17 patient procedures, which I have done 17 procedures in probably several months uh, in a given day. Um, so the reality is that people see hope. There's always hope in this world, you know, and uh, we can always, you know, COVID-19 will go away. We have overcome a lot. Um, but the reality is that as long as we remain smart, as long as we understand the common sense of exercise and, and, and diet, I mean, the, what Chef Gorski just, just made today, I mean, I'm, I'm dying to go to his restaurant and try that, that sandwich. That, was, that looked delicious. But, you know, just because you're home doesn't mean you don't exercise or you don't eat right or not take your medications on, at the appropriate time. Those are all of paramount importance. So I thank you all for listening to me for about 15 minutes. I was given a deadline of 15 minutes, so I did it in 13, so I'm very happy. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I thank- um, Dr. Dr. Johar, we actually do have a question from the audience. Um, a participant wants to know, will we need to practice social distancing until we find a vaccine or an effective treatment? Yes, very simple answer, absolutely yes. Uh, you know, things we've seen in Florida with the beaches and California and Colorado with the, with the bars, you know, in South Korea, they, 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 the nightclubs, the nightclubs were opened and they saw a surge in, um, in COVID-19 rates. So we have to be smart. Denmark did it right. Sweden did it wrong um, with all due respect. And if you follow the Denmark protocol, of, of opening because we have to open. I mean, I am so sick and tired of eating, eating home cooked food every single day. I love my wife's cooking and, and I, my, 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 my son who loves to cook, but I would rather, I'd like to go out to a restaurant and I would like to go play tennis again. Um, so we all need to get out, but do it smart. Any other questions? Wow. Um, am I muted? I think I'm unmuted. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Wow, that was so fantastic. I'm Christina Chavetta, chair of the Hamptons Heart Ball. And first off, I want to thank you, Matt, for an excellent vegan tuna salad recipe. I have to say I made it alongside everyone and it was absolutely delicious. And I'm not a tuna girl, so it worked perfect. Um, and Dr. Hajar, thank you so much for taking the time out of your extremely busy day to share all that info with us. I think it really helped everyone feel a little more calm. Um, we can't thank you enough for the work you and all of your colleagues are doing across New York right now during this difficult and most challenging time. And lastly, I would like to thank everyone who was able to join us today. I hope you guys enjoyed making uh, Matt's tuna salad and also hearing everything from Dr. Hajar um, as much as I did. I think it was super, super educational. And um, I just want to give a shout out that I hope everyone can join us on June 20th for our first ever virtual Hamptons Heart Ball. Cannot wait to see you all there.
Thank you. Have a great day.